everyone, my name is Loco, and welcome back to a professional match of StarCraft 2. Now, what I've got for you today is the finals of the ESL Open Cup 222 for the European server. And we're back to the good old matchup between these two pro gamers. As in the top right-hand corner in game number one on the map Dynasty, we have none other than Max Pax and his opponent in the opposite corner, joined by the little polar bear. This can only ever be Mr. Kalem. For a little while there, Raynor was being an absolute nuisance to both Max Pax and Clem. So over the last half year, it seems like Max Pax and Clem meet in the finals of this weekly cup pretty much all the time. But then over the course of like the last month, maybe the last month and a half or so, Raynor has been making to the he, yeah, he has been making it to the finals more so than not. And that obviously means that he took down one of these two, sometimes even both, along the way. That being said, Raynor is currently over in South Korea. He decided to do, yeah, to do a little, what are we doing? To do a little bit of traveling, and I think he plans on competing in the GSO Codes. So he's no longer playing in the weekly European Cup. Really, Max Pax? Well, that is something I have never seen before. Are we going to take it? Yep. Do I have music on, by the way? I do. Apparently it was just very quiet in the background. The voices in my head were getting louder. Um, what is this? So, <laughs> this is the original intent behind this map, right? This entire design feature where you can decide to take the low ground expo over here right at the very beginning, but then with a regular gas geyser, or you can take it a little bit later on and take the rich Vespian geyser. I have never seen anybody take this as their very first expansion. Now, there has been... There's been a lot of fighting, right, across these mineral fields. So say Maxpex takes the Nexus over here, Terran can like send in a Reaper first, and then a Cyclone later, and it becomes kind of a mess to try and defend any of these sections of the map. Hmm, alright. In the meantime, on the other side though, Clem has just begun his own command center at home. He's decided to go for a quick double gas. So it's gonna be a factory after the barracks here, nice and early. And Clem is scouting around. Yeah, he has seen that. Is this good? The main issue, I guess, with this position is that Maxpex is gonna have to send units for defense all the way around. Now he's gonna be recalling about half of the workers. <laughs> Alright. We did have a little bit of a dodge right there, despite the fact that there's a shield battery. Is this easier to defend like this than if you were to put your Nexus over there? I'm not 100% sure. Maybe. I guess one of the advantages, at least, is that you get that rich Vespian Geyser, which returns twice as much gas a trip as a conventional gas geyser, but ultimately you're really only saving yourself a handful of probes. Hmm. It's just gonna be a regular Stargate follow-up. Shield battery over here, too. I think this is fine, actually, for Max Max. Yeah. It's just a bit weird, because normally, right, whenever you take a really quick gold base as, like, a proxy expansion, and this kind of feels like a proxy base, the opponent really has to address it. But since Clem has got his own mineral fields right over here, I don't think he really cares. Wait. Hello, Clem? Oh, I thought for a second he was gonna... Okay, he just made a mistake. I thought for a second he was gonna load... Oh no, this is a giant error, actually. I thought for a second he was gonna load the SCVs into the command center and fly it to the other side as well. That would have been amazing. Oracle shows up. This is actually a, a very significant blunder right here by the French Terran. Now he notices, but that was, I want to say, at least 30 seconds or so, where about five SCVs were on strike. Yeah, they wanted better wages. It's a very dangerous job. The odds of you getting hit in the face by a stalker are eh, probably about 80%. <laughs> Hazard pay at the bare minimum would be a very reasonable thing. Clem apparently just told him, no, 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 no. It's okay. Oracle in the meantime, by the way, threw a revelation over here, but no SCVs killed on that side of the map. Looks like the gold base actually worked out fine. Well... Unless we just let a couple of these things slide by. We did have a couple of stalkers here, but I think he's actually purposely skipping it. Trying to defend here with the reinforcements instead. Because I think he's about ready to start harassing, Max Pax that is, the SCVs now from the other side. 
Oh, one of the Cyclones, very exposed. Stalker already went down, though. Blink has just begun after the Stargate shenanigans. So it's just a single Oracle. Not a follow-up into Phoenixes and, for example, Colossi. What? No, <laughs> no way! Okay, that was a misclick. I think that was supposed to be a scan. Yeah. That would be very bad-mannered to drop a mule on your opponent's army. Um, we used to see that a lot in the early days of StarCraft 2. <laughs> we used to see that a lot in the early days of StarCraft 2 whenever players were like, OUT OF MY GAME! I'VE WON! GET OUT! They would like scan and then drop a bunch of mules on the opponent's army. We don't really see that anymore these days. Because it turns out you don't make friends by being bad-mannered. And it turns out if you want to get good at a game, you also kind of do need friends to practice against. I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit of BM again like that from time to time, you know? Remember when Zerks used to just send a drone towards the opponent's natural expansion at like the 17 minute mark and just build a base? <laughs> just to indicate that they needed to get out. Couple of mistakes here though, by Clem. SCV's not mining for a bit, Mule misclicked. All of it obviously is, uh, yeah, in isolation, not that big of a deal. But it is something worth noting, because at this level of play, the margin for error is tiny. And Max Pax is already incredibly scary at this stage in the game. It's gonna be Templar Archives over here, together with the Charge Research. Plus one coming up as well. Storm on the back it is too, okay. Main issue, I guess, is that any sort of timing attack is just going to hit harder, right? So luckily here for Klim, Maxpex does not commit to like a mass aggression with Blink Stalkers. But if you make a bunch of mistakes and already normally, right, if everything goes according to plan, you just barely hold on. If you make a bunch of mistakes, then suddenly those pushes are so much more terrifying. Anyways, Stimpak, Combat Shields, plus one infantry weapons finishing up right now for uh, our Terran player. And that is going to give him a little bit more maneuverability around the map. In the meantime, by the way, Maxpex hasn't really, as far as I have been able to catch, he hasn't really made any mistakes. I mean, obviously, he lost a bunch of probes there to those Hellions and stuff, but he cut a few corners and he's been able to get away with it. No real blunders, I guess, is maybe a better way to put it. Can we blink? Blink, 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 blink! Aww. One second too late, lost an extra Stalker. Now Storm, though, is finishing up, and usually that is the upgrade you try to buy time for. So we do have a bunch of Templar that are currently chilling inside of the plane. Fourth Nexus coming up. Okay. Storm drops on this map, by the way, very scary. I've seen it a bunch of times right over here in this particular section. These units all tend to clump up a lot, and usually you also park some army units in that mineral line. So Storm's right over there in that spot would be amazing here for Maxpex. I don't think Clem realizes exactly what he's playing against, but then again, he hasn't seen any Colossi. So where's that gas going here off Maxpex? Because he obviously did take the Rich Vespian Geyser here early on. There's no way he's gonna take that risk and then not take the, the gas. Okay, another Zealot Warp in. He's being very, uh... Very safe here with the Templar. Not really running into any... Okay, there you go, now he shows them. Not really running them into any location where they might get picked off. Okay, it's a dance party. The Marines, Marauders, Medivacs and Siege Tanks are gonna have to make sure that they dodge those storms to the best of their abilities. Whereas Max Pax, he's dancing the tango right now, I think. He is ready to storm whoever wants to stay close. Mm. Is he just going to commit into this choke point? Oh my god, Max Pax. Big storms, I mean, are possible here. He is forcing that entire Terran ball to go all the way back. Dangerous decision making right here by Max Pax, but I think he may have found a bit of an opportunity to overwhelm the Terran. Yeah, big warp in just like that. Wow, Max Pax absolutely crushes Clem. Yeah, that's what you get for dropping a mule on your opponent's army, Clem. You get punished immediately. Maxpex certainly does have that killer instinct, though. All jokes aside. He saw an opportunity, and I wasn't 100% sure about it myself, but he saw an opportunity. And even though the supply counts were quite even, he decided to, yeah, 
just jump on top of that army. That map, by the way, does seem to be very good for Protoss overall. Dynasty, that is. Um, I was looking at the win-loss ratios for Terran versus Zerg this morning. And currently at the tournament level, I don't think I've ever seen... So we do have a proxy barracks going up. I don't think I've ever quite seen a win rate like this, right? So obviously the maps are pretty new, the sample size is pretty low. But the win rate for Terran versus Zerg on Dynasty is at like 87% at the tournament level. <laughs> I'm surprised we see any Zergs currently playing the map, but it does seem to get picked from time to time. For the Protoss versus Terran matchup on Dynasty, it is slightly in favor of Protoss, actually. But obviously the sample sizes are very, very small and... Well, clearly, we haven't quite figured out how to play the map yet, because what Maxpex just did does actually seem quite clever. I just wonder if Terran could have punished it a little bit harder with like a double cyclone opener or something along with those lines. Alrighty, so scoutless start right here for Maxpex. That does mean that he doesn't, well, he doesn't see what he's playing against, right? Which is always a bit of an issue. This Reaper is going to arrive nice and early. And it's a bit of a skill check in a way. Double gas on the Beckidus, so I'm expecting a factory here in just a moment. Bunker goes up as well over in the natural expansion, and this is something that Maxpex sees right now. Puts out a pylon right next to that bunker. Not really all too faced. So, main issue here is obviously you have to micro your probes, because initially against the first Reaper, and there might be a second one, but initially you're not going to have any units. Until the cybernetics core is done, you cannot make adepts and you cannot make stalkers. Nor can you make sentries, but we don't usually see those at this point in the game of uh, Protoss versus Terran. So the dance continues. Just on another map. This time around, it's between probes and a Reaper. Alright, easily handled. He did finish the bunker in the meantime, by the way. Yeah, shoot battery coming up. It's totally fine here for max specs. Like, this always looks a little scary for Protoss, but ultimately, a Reaper instead of a bunker doesn't really deal that much damage. So this dance is always kind of fun. So if you actually put the SCV inside of the bunker before the shot connects, <laughs> it doesn't register as damage. So if you deal enough damage to the battery and it falls, <laughs> it is technically something that can deal a lot of damage. All right, well, shield battery is actually going to go down, but it has obviously been a target here for quite a while. Third Stalker is going to be out in just a moment. This becomes really sketchy if Terran can keep this bunker alive until the Cyclone comes across the map. So Cyclone just popped out of the factory. This is one of the arguments for like, for example, proxying the factory, because imagine if it was already here right now. Okay, one Stalker is certainly going to fall. Pylon targeted down as well. Getting the Pylon is actually quite good. Yeah. That's going to supply block Protoss. So the Stargate just finished up, but he currently can't make it. Yeah. Okay, Insta Twilight Council here to make up for those lost resources. Third gas guys are coming up already for Clem, it looks like. It's a bit of an interesting one. We'll have to see exactly what his follow-up is going to be, as we do have a tech lab right now on the starboard. Cyclone in the meantime, dancing around. Didn't get proxied, but... Oh, oh, there you go. Good micro here, of course, by both players, by the way. Yeah, this is the type of stuff where if you're not a pro gamer, you're already dead. Like, if you play against these two, or really any of the guys at the highest level, right? But if you play against them at this point, you're already dead. Like, Clem would have already destroyed you if you did not micro it pretty much perfectly. Same for, uh, for mech specs here. If Terran would have given away one too many units, then suddenly those stalkers go across the map and... He probably wouldn't have been supply blocked, there would be an oracle on the other side now too. Life becomes very difficult. Ultimately though, who is really ahead after this early game? Yeah. I don't mind it for either of them, I think both of them are pretty content with the current situation. This is obviously a very delayed oracle, which makes it a bit awkward right now. Sometimes a delayed timing attack works out better than an optimally timed one, because there's a good chance that Clem is no longer expecting any Cyclones. Or any Oracles, rather. Yeah, so there is a Cyclone available for base defense. <laughs> Max Pax is actually giving his opponent the benefit of the doubt here. He's assuming that there's like a, a Widow Mine or something burrowed here to try and protect the Mineral Line. I think ultimately he could have killed at least like four or five workers. But 
He decided to give uh, Clem the benefit of the doubt. Okay. So, third next is coming up. Banshee available now too. No detection here at the moment, other than his Oracle. Oracle does have energy. You need to go to the natural. Revelation is an activated ability on the Oracle. That gives them vision for 15 seconds. There we go. And the Phoenix is out, so... That Banshee pilot just trying to maximize the damage. There's Stimpak coming up. We'll see combat shields in just a moment. And I'm assuming plus one infantry weapons will begin here. Right around the same time too for Clem as soon as he's got the gas for it. Okay. Here go the Stalkers. Maxpex, of course, did get that Blink upgrade going. Pretty sure this man dreams of Blink Stalkers all day and every night. Just... <laughs> dreaming of the perfect Blink control. It is something we can all aspire to. But very rarely do we see the perfect game. It has happened, by the way. So we do have the Phoenix coming across the map to provide high ground vision. There's only one siege tank in the main base right now, so not a lot of vision. And actually, you know what? That tech lab is very exposed. Say goodbye to Stimpak. And getting the snipe on Stimpak is actually huge. Because that is the pivotal upgrade. Like, that is how every single Terran timing attack works. Right? You need, you need Stimpak. So, it starts up again in the tech lab that was previously researching combat shields. But Clem decided to cancel combat shields in favor of Stimpak. That's how badly he wants to have it. But this is going to give Max Pax a lot of confidence as far as like the base defense goes over here. There was another Benchy apparently. Nine probes in total is pretty nice, but yeah, I don't disagree right here with Max. May just want to go ahead and head on down to the low ground. Put down a couple pylons and potentially prepare another base. Although, I don't know if this is going to be blocking a base. That could block the Nexus. Okay. Five additional gateways on the production tab. Charge, also coming up. Plus one ground weapons is just about to finish too. Is this, is this blocking the base? I feel like it's blocking the base. I don't really know exactly how much distance and how much space. Nah, that's definitely blocking the base. That's a little bit awkward. Anyways. Oracle does reveal exactly what's going on, and it turns out Klim is just happily macroing up. So, even though his Stimpak and all the other stuff did get delayed for quite a while, ultimately he will finish up those upgrades, and his Marines will become more powerful. It's not like Max Pax here was transitioning towards quick Colossi or anything along those lines. If he had a couple Colossi down right now, I think this would be quite difficult for Terran to deal with. Because, well, any timing attack with Stimpak at that point would be resisted with Colossi. But since that's not the case, I think Clem doesn't really need to sit back all too much. We have a fourth Nexus going down on the left side instead, by the way. There's the Robo Bay. Apparently, our Protoss here decided to prioritize the Dark Shrine. Second Forge as well, so we're just playing a big macro game here. Okay. Let's see. I actually don't know what the win-loss ratio is for El Cyane. Should I look it up? I have a little bit of time right now. El Cyane Liquipedia. So at the tournament level, for the Protoss versus Terran matchup, 250... No, 340 games have been played. That's quite a few, because we do have an engagement over here. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of siege tanks. So Clem can dance. But not too far forward. 340 games have been played at the tournament level of Protoss versus Terran. Oh, uh, and Protoss has won 44.7% of them. So 152 wins for Protoss, 188 wins for Terran. Not too bad. Obviously, Alcyone has been around for quite a bit at this point. I wonder if that's the accurate... Statistic. I kind of feel like there may have been more games played than 340 for this particular matchup. But I'm not 100% sure. I actually used to think that like Liquipedia and Illegalek and whatnot somehow, some way had some sort of automated system built in. Where 
whenever a tournament match was played, it would just automatically be added into the mix. It took me about five years of watching StarCraft 2 before I realized that, nope. <laughs> There's a bunch of uh, unsung heroes in the StarCraft community that manually update that with every single tournament game. Which is kind of crazy. Anyways, Zealot run by over here inside of the natural expansion. Main base now also in a bit of trouble. But the Vikings, together with the Ghost, will be able to make short work of it. So the main goal for these attacks right here for Max Packs is just to buy time. Like, he is spending his money here, and he ultimately will have a very powerful force, but these upgrades are expensive. So he needs to buy as much time as possible. Plus, on top of that, he already is securing another Nexus here in the far top left hand corner of the map. I think that this is mostly just because he blocked that expansion down south, but... He's been happily uh, expanding on the left side of the map, all the way up to 83 probes right now, which is substantially more than the Terran. Now Clem, not really taking a whole lot of risk so far in this particular match, is just happily macroing up and going into plus two, but there might be an opportunity for him to attack. Misrelli Disruptor. Maybe not Misrelli, but a little far forward. I think Nile might be a good time, Clem, to scan your opponent, to drop a Manor Mule and go attack. I, I think that, may maybe skip the Manor Mule this game. But I, I just kind of feel like it would be a good addition here. Triple Disruptor production, by the way. Ay -ay -ay. Plus one air weapons coming up, second Stargate. He's pretending like he wants to fight, but I don't think Maxpex really wants to fight. He's just stepping around the map. Hoping to maybe draw the Terran player out. Difficult, of course, for Terran to really... Um, well, fight into Disruptors and all the rest of it. And we've got a lot of Disruptors here. So, Triple Robo, just producing non-stop Disruptors. While making a transition towards what seems to be a Skytel's army. At this point, though, there's no Fleet Beacon yet. So, it's a little funky to see a second Stargate start up. Hmm. Maybe he forgot that he actually started this game with a Stargate. Yeah, I think that's the case, actually. I think Max Pax may believe that this was his first Stargate that he produced, because when he wanted to make that Oracle at the very beginning of the game, he was supply blocked because of the opponent killing that pylon here. So I think he may just assume that this is... <laughs> I think it's a little misplay. Nothing all too significant. But normally you go three Stargates at this point. And then you use the first Stargate, that obviously unlocks the Fleet Beacon, to build the Fleet Beacon. But now he waited until the second Stargate was done, and then he put down the Fleet Beacon. So that's a little dis disjointed, but should be alright. Okay. The Command Center Explosion, or as Clem likes to call it. Le Explosion de Command Center. I, th I think that's how it goes. Something like that. There's a lot of them coming up. Obviously, they will be growing nice little orbital command hats and potentially a planetary fortress hat as well for one or two. Tempest coming up. Okay. So this is an interesting situation. Clem is getting to the point where he's got that Ghost Liberator army coming up. Usually, the response from Protoss... <laughs> That's one way of doing it. Usually the response for Protoss is Blink Stalker or Tempest. Main reason why we don't see a lot of Tempest play in 2024 is because it takes ages to transition into and the unit just honestly feels kind of terrible. It's just slow and sluggish, not nearly as microable as say for example, I don't know, like a Viking. Right, these units feel pretty good, Tempest feel bad. This is however, Max Specs making Tempest before any Liberator hit the battlefield. So he's doing that off of the back of Mass Disruptor play. Ooh, really? Yeah, he really wanted to get that. Okay, well that was a little ambitious. In the meantime, we have a warp in again in the main base. Zealots and Dark Templar. Very curious though, what I'm trying to get at. Very curious to see how well this Tempest Ball will do against, well, what Terran's going for. Has Clem already figured this out, by the way? Has he scanned? No. He has not scanned this section of the map, so he does not know, I don't think, unless... Oh, yeah, he sees a, a bunch of Tempest over here. Okay, because he did start firing up a bunch of these uh, Vikings. Dark Temple on the right side of the map. Main Protoss Ball here on the left side of the map. 
I really like how Max Specs has such a range in his playstyle, though. Because this is the exact opposite of that, like, mass stalker zealot army that he's been playing quite a bit. With a heavy focus on, like, the early game units. This is him basically skipping most of the early game. As, you know, is reasonable. And he's going straight into Mass Disruptor, Mass Colossi, Mass Tempest. Which is a very different approach. I don't know if this is really that good against somebody of the caliber of Clem. But it is certainly very different. So he's taking every base on his side of the map. Uh, there's one expansion still in the bottom right, but currently he doesn't have the worker count for it. Clem, by the way, doing this style that I'm not personally a big fan of as a fan of StarCraft. Because we do have a big engagement over here. Okay, some decent disruptor hits. Terran is going to start chasing some of these army units away, because most of the shields at this point are gone. Got to be careful here, though, as Clem, because this Protoss army can turn around and suddenly start fighting you. Yeah, Clem mostly doing um, just a very passive approach here. Not really committing to anything all too aggressively, just turtling up. He did retaliate here a little bit, I guess, just now, but for the most part, his plan is just to sit back and build up to an or about a dozen orbital commands. I think Tempests are such a cool unit, but they really do feel pretty terrible to play. I don't recommend playing... Uh, playing a whole lot of Tempests. They just feel so slow and sluggish. They did make them slightly more microable a couple of patches ago, but it doesn't really seem that noteworthy. Actually, I think if Protoss needs any buff still, you know, like if that is one of the discussion points again that we're gonna have in a few months from now. Uh, Karen grabs a lot of these units. Colossus ends up going down. Another one is gonna find the grave. Third one also falls. Tempest drops out of the sky. Yeah, it's so tricky. You kind of need... Hmm. It's difficult to make that decision. Suddenly, Clem is everywhere. He finds himself with a 50 supply lead. It's just so difficult. Like, when you're relying on all these, like, tricky units. So, Colossi on their own are kind of tricky. Tempest, obviously, are kind of tricky. Disruptors are a little tricky, too. You don't really have much of a backbone to your army. Then suddenly, this super solid Terran Bio Ball, which is something we see in almost every game, is just much better. But it depends exactly on the opportunity, right? Because if you... Manage to land a nice disruptor hit, or the Tempests are just poking away at the units over time. That fight can go in favor of Protals. But, uh, yeah. Clem just uh, grabbed the opportunity with both hands. Anyways, what I was saying is, if Protals in the end still is going to need more buffs for whatever reason. A little early to say right now with the patch still being so new. But I think a small little buff to the micro-ability of a Tempest would be really nice. Because Tempests really do feel really bad. Same for Carriers. Carriers also feel kind of bad for some reason. These should just kind of attack move though and they seem to work. But Tempests very frequently just don't seem to do what you want them to do. They glide a lot and stuff. Kind of slow. I'm not in love with the Tempest. Expansion in the top left hand corner. Does get scouted. I actually don't think Protoss needs any buffs overall, to be honest. I think Protoss is fine. Way too early to tell with the new patch at the very least. Now, these Tempests do keep the Protoss alive for a little bit. It's just kind of... It, this is kind of feeling like one of those games where Terran is starting to suffocate Protoss quite a bit. Loads of probes have gone down. Looks like this base over here also got denied by the siege tanks up on the high ground. Clem just has this super solid, solid army. Adds on so many of these uh, orbital commands as well. Even though he's kind of winning this fight. Yeah. The one issue you can run into with Terran, and we see that from time to time, is that they get a little carried away with the amount of command centers that they're producing. Like sometimes you build too many of them too fast. And then you realize, wait a second, if I have 5,000 minerals caught up in command centers, I can't actually build an army. But assuming Clem doesn't roll over here in the next couple of minutes, <laughs> he should have a much better army in the in the long run. Oh, that was a good Nova.
Mama ship coming up as well. Fighting into a planetary fortress, though, does feel a bit tricky, but... Uh, we have the reinforcing Terran units coming from the right side of this base. Good effort right here by Maxpex, though, because he just lost a ton of stuff. He's going to finish up plus three air weapons in just a second as well. Obviously, every single one of those interceptor ships benefits from that greatly. Okay, good control right here by Klim. Microing both that bio army as well as the Vikings. Trying to make sure that he is hovering around this space where the Vikings can hit the Colossi. Or, I guess, the Tempest in this particular spot. And then also, obviously, running away with the bio units from those Novas. All Clem really wants to do right now is stabilize for a little bit. If you give this man a couple minutes to breathe, he should feel far more comfortable. That again, though, Max Max has been rebuilding his economy. Here's Mama. She can provide more micro-ability to this Protoss army, but it also, obviously, is another hotkey to use. Okay. Yeah, watching these two play against each other is so much fun. They're so evenly matched. I think recently Clem has had the majority of their wins. But if anybody is going to beat Clem, I honestly feel like it's Max Max. I'm not even sure who else can really reliably win against Max or against Clem Rotter. Okay. Plus three, by the way, here for the flying units as well for the Terran. Coming up soon. Ooh, disruptors for some reason. Just move commanded forward. I don't love that. Pretty significant blunder. There is no High Templar transition, right? And I get it, because he's been playing disruptors this entire time, and he's going up against Mass Ghost. So that transition is not easy. Very expensive unit. But you do kind of miss that second source of splash damage, I suppose. Oh, very ambitious force field. Yeah, when I say Clem has been winning the majority of their encounters, I want to say maybe like 60 to 40 or something. Like, it's not been overwhelmingly in favor of him. But that's just my feeling. I don't actually know the numbers. If I were to assign a favorite... Ooh, we have a tactical nuke coming across the map as well. Okay. I think I would probably go with Clem. The probes do notice exactly what's going on. Time Warp moves forward here as well. Tactical nuke is going to land. Don't do it! No! Okay, well, they do find that spot. In the meantime, though, Max Max is pushing away that main army of Clem right now. Another tactical nuke, by the way, is indeed researching, so we should have that available within the next half minute. Ship weapons level 3 are finishing up right now, but this is a bit awkward because a lot of the Terran units have already gone down. Big EMPs are softening up a ton of these Protoss units. And I think ultimately, yeah, Max Max is hitting a brick wall. He felt compelled, like, he, he felt the need of finishing this game right here and potentially winning it. Because in the long run, all of those orbital commands just give so much income. If you hear a bunch of uh, thunder in the background... Apparently there's a storm outside, but luckily I'm inside and I'm watching two fellow gamers play video games really good But if there is suddenly a bunch of noise or if suddenly um, <clears throat> I disappear <laughs> I guess either my internet or my computer cut out that has never happened oh, actually that happened once to me when I was very young I don't specifically remember this But I remember once upon a time when I was I was probably like maybe eight years old my dad apparently was just sitting by the window, as old men do, right? He was just sitting by the window, and it was thundering outside. And he swears that he could see the impact of where the thunder hit our front yard. And he he says that he saw the thunder roll all over the, like, over the ground outside. And as a result of that, everything in our home broke. Everything from, like, the central heating to all of our electronic devices... It was a bit of a disaster. I don't remember specifically because I was very young, but I remember the entire family being pretty dang panicked. Yeah. Apparently, uh, the insurance company ultimately did come in pretty clutch, but we were without, like, proper heating for <laughs> quite a while. <laughs> and this was not, like, a, a nice and, you know, warm time of the year, of course. <laughs> 
Yeah, that is also coincidentally the day that I got my superpowers. Yeah. This is the uh, villain origin story right here. Yeah, a little bit of loco lore. Remember the day. I guess that's what it's like, though. Uh, what it's like when you're a Terran Marine and suddenly a High Templar shows up. Yeah, maybe your entire suit shuts down. Or worse, your internet. Ay, yeah, yeah. Imagine life without the internet. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Alright, it's going to be an adept coming right up. I recently found out that some people, right, on planet Earth, historically as well, but also people that are still alive, right? Get this. I learned recently that apparently they grew up without the internet. And for some people in the Earth's history, they didn't have internet at all. Yeah. All those Egyptian pharaohs, all those Roman emperors, they may have been rich, but they had no internet. What's the point? How are they going to progress their RuneScape accounts? How are they going to share memes? How are they going to trash talk on, on Twitter? What's even the point? Maybe the Sphinx is a 5G tower, though. That could be. That would explain the shape of the pyramids, too. You could put a really nice... <laughs> you could put a really nice receiver on top of that bad boy. Anyways. Reaper going around. Mostly just dancing. These guys are dancing a lot. In the previous game, Clem danced substantially better than Max Pax. The thing is, Max Pax wanted to go for a dance that required seven feet. And it's technically possible, it's just really difficult to do. The Disruptor, Tempest, Oracle, Mama Ship, like, it's a great combination of units, but at the same time, once you start uh, struggling and you, uh, yeah, start maybe uh, stepping over your own feet a little bit, life does become a bit more, a little bit more tricky. It's gonna be a Blink Stalker opener this time around. Good old double barracks here. Triple barracks, even. For Mr. Klim, so... Delayed starport for him, but a whole load of bio units. How many gateways are we going to produce? Usually it is two, three, or four. It seems like against opponents that Max Specs respects, he goes about two gateways. And then against opponents who he can easily beat, he usually makes four and then he just goes to win the game. <laughs> it's actually kind of fun looking at the regional events. All the top tier Protoss players are doing a ton of four gating against players that are not as good as them. So they just four gate blink, or all, uh, blink stalker all in and just kind of win. But then, as soon as they go up against the likes of, for example, Clem, we have entirely different strategies. Alright, so this is gonna be Triple Gate into a third Nexus. Triple Gate is kind of like the middle of the road approach. So you can technically take a third Nexus off of two gateways. You can deal a lot of damage and actually expand behind two on four gateways. Three gateways is kind of like the... I don't know what I want to order from the menu, so I get a little bit of both. Right? It's it's okay. There's the third Nexus coming up. Obviously, it's more stalker heavy than the two gateway approach. Thing is, though, Clem has got a massive army here for this stage in the game. Yeah, I think Max Pax could win against it quite comfortably, but he didn't realize that it was moving across the map. Cancel? No cancel? How did we... Okay. How did we not cancel that? That's quite pricey. Is there enough, though, for Terran to actually break through all of this? With good pickup control? Exactly. You can save the majority of these stalkers. And even though that was 400 minerals down the drain, these marines are gonna do a uh, final stand over here. A final piece of glory. They get combat shields in minus three seconds of their life. It's a little sad, really, but... Okay. Honestly, I think that exchange would have been fine if Max Pax actually just cancelled the Nexus. If he would have encountered that Terran army, though, as it was moving across the map, that could have gone horribly wrong for Clem. Because imagine that fight with the siege tanks unseaged and without those units first off killing a base. Oh, 
Okay. Well, we're still going to do the stalker dance inside of the main. <laughs> now we're awkwardly trying to ferry units out of the base again. <laughs> yeah, we're going to just continue with four, apparently, which is fair enough. Okay. Well, apparently Siege Tank in range of that section of the map, too. Is going to push him away for the time being. There's the Dark Shrine. There is the first forge actually coming up. Additional gateways. Bit of fighting here at the front, but Clem, yeah, grabbing a nice little supply lead at this point in time. Fires up his third command center. And he'll be going into the double medevac production eventually. So we are still at zero medevacs at this point in the game. Mostly just because he decided to go for the triple rex. Okay. Yeah, so you can't really attack very easily here as Terran. That's the main downside. So you, you secure this advantage in the supply cost, but you can't really leverage your way into a, an easy fight. Because these stalkers are going to slow you down so much when you try to move across the map. And at the same time, as soon as you move across, say you unsiege everything and you move across with your entire army, these stalkers are going to slow you down and you get backstabbed about a million times by not just Zealots, but also Dark Templar. So even though Clem doesn't really know exactly what he's playing against, it is kind of risky for him to go for a big move. So instead, even though there's a substantial supply advantage here for Terran, yeah, he's going to try and see if he can get some damage done over here, maybe send a Medivac across the map. Anyways, now he knows of the Dark Templar too. Obviously, there will be scans available, but this is one of those annoying moments for Terran. Where everything's been going quite well for you. Maybe you get a little lucky sometimes, maybe you don't, but everything's been going quite well. Oh, getting these stalkers killed would be amazing. He's gonna get one, maybe two. Concussive shells are handy. Oh, he's getting greedy. He wanted to hit the third one as well. <laughs> Dark Templar, in the meantime, though, is still being an uh, absolute pain in the butt. And the prism decides to disappear. An actual Grim Reaper. Yeah, 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 yeah. At least in this game, you know that your SCVs are under attack. <laughs> in StarCraft Brute War, this is one of the... I never understood how this worked until somebody explained it to me. So in StarCraft 1, when you have a bunch of Dark Templar demolishing your mineral line, you don't get a notification that your units are under attack, right? You don't get that notification. And I didn't understand this for like a decade. Apparently the reason is quite simple. Since they're not actually damaging units, they're killing them in one hit, you do not get a notification that the units are under attack because they're being one shot, one at a time. Which is one of the most painful things when you're not a god at StarCraft 1. Suddenly a Dark Templar showing up and you don't realize it and you look back at your base and everything's gone. While you're trying to fight the AI. <laughs> it's all the unit movement and the pathing and whatnot. Very painful. You're fighting with the game the entire time. You don't even get a notification that your workers are under attack. I guess technically they're not under attack. They're just being killed. Not quite the same thing. Speaking of workers getting killed, though, one of the guys is still going to town. The SCVs wanted to go for the surround, which would have been a dangerous decision regardless. Yeah, Clem thinking about marching across the map, but he doesn't really know exactly what's going on. Like, another downside, right? He doesn't know what sort of splash damage there is. So, in this particular instance, there's four Templar in a plane, but there could be Colossi, there could be Disruptors, and while you're trying to manage these Zealot runbys at home, so this is really lovely work here from Max Pax, while you're, yep, yeah, exactly, this is what I'm talking about. While you're managing those Zealot runbys and Dark Templar at home, it's so easy to get your entire army destroyed by splash damage. Lovely stuff right here by Max Pax, all things considered, but still a very significant supply deficit. There's the Ghost Academy coming up. And apparently now we're gonna go into the Robo Bay. To extend our thermal lens. Nothing quite like extending your thermal lens. A lot of bases being built here. Max Pax has actually managed to 
keep the Terran player at bay, despite the fact that Clem has had, like, a 20 supply advantage for quite a while here. Now the eco difference, though, is going to start kicking in. Obviously, mules are nice, but they don't quite make up the difference that Maxpex has got at this point, so... For a long time in this game, Clem has been yeah, quite far ahead, but right now we're kind of at a spot where... <laughs> Picked it up in the prism. He made a room inside of that prism for a uh, prism rather for the no 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 don't lose it Okay oh, Lovely stuff really the blink stalker control is really good in the meantime. There was also a win on mine drop Okay armory coming up ooh Clem actually making a little bit of a mistake It's 50 gas cheaper, but just as easy to forget this does mean that plus two is going to be substantially delayed. Maxpex already fired up plus three, by the way. Plus one armor just finished up for the ground units. What am I drop once more? Good response. That's another theme I've noticed so far in the regionals. Whenever we have... Ooh, it's a currently ongoing event, but... Whenever there's like a lower tier... Protoss going up against a top tier Terran. They just tear them apart with Widowmine drops. Widowmine nerf or not? It's funny, like, guys of this caliber can absolutely destroy lower ranking pro gamers with just Blink Stalkers or just Widowmine drops. Becomes spectacular though when they're playing against each other. Storms are suddenly everywhere. My god. The weather forecasting game is similar to that of real life. Zealots coming in from the flank as well, from the right side, and even though Maxpex has been behind supply-wise for a long time, I think this may just be a moment where he's gonna grab a little advantage here, especially when he's gonna do another warp in. Colossi having a grand old time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Massive warp in over here. Six Stalkers together with six Zealots. Twelve gateways in total at this point in time. Good kiting as well by Clem, though. It's a tough fight for him, but I think he managed to just deflect that Protoss army. Okay, and he actually is securing a fourth base. <laughs> it's kind of nuts. Clem... Hmm. I think Maxpex could have had Clem busy over here up north as well, right? So he made the decision to do that big warp in and then try to chase down the main army to potentially close out the game. He could have split off a few Zealots to go after these SCVs here to ultimately really seal the deal. This is still a significant advantage right now for the Danish Protoss, but he does need to be cautious. I think in hindsight, he should have split off a few units to harass that base at the 12 o'clock position, because just a couple seconds ago, there was no planetary there. Plus two, plus two is now finishing up for Clem as well, though, and that is going to make life a little bit easier. We have Marines apparently brave enough to get sliced up by a man who has literal swords for hands. Actually, no, they have hands and swords. Basically, the X-Men. Anyways, Max Pex smelling blood in the water. He feels like he could potentially win the game right here, right now. It is a little dangerous, though, because a lot of these units are very exposed. Ultimately, the Protoss army is just much too big. Maxpex gets a second point on the board. Next up, we find ourselves on the map site. Delta. Expertly played just now by Maxpex. He got a little more lucky at the very beginning of the game when Clem first moved across the map and he didn't cancel his third base. That was a uh, an unfortunate sequence, I guess. But he managed to stay alive and honestly after that he played really, really well. The thing is, the only reason why that push worked is because Clem, well, pretty much just got a little lucky. Very easy for that fight to go entirely different, for him to not get the third Nexus, and then suddenly it's an absolute disaster for Terran. Obviously, the new multiplayer balance patch was mostly put together to try and help out, well, the highest ranked players in the world. Protoss players, that is. Face specifically against Terran a little bit more... A little bit more consistently. And so far, Protoss actually does seem to be doing a little bit better, right? GSL Code S Top 4, for example, had two Protosses in it. 
Now, ultimately, a Terran ended up winning it, so it's a, it's a little bit, a little bit of a different story. But overall, Protoss does seem to be performing a little bit better. It is going to be very interesting, though, in like the next half year or so. Like, there's a good chance that Protoss is going to do better until Saro comes back from the military. <laughs> Like, there's this very strange discrepancy between, like, the top-tier players. So, I was just talking about Max Specs and Clem easily beating guys that are lower ranked than them, right? If you look at a guy in the top 50 of Grandmaster League, so basically the top 50 of every server, it's not even like they're playing the same game. Like, you put Clem against a rank 50 Protoss, he will murder him. The same for Max Specs. You put him against a top 50 Terran, it's not even gonna be close. And I guess there's a little bit of a skill discrepancy, too, within, like, the top five players. It's very hard to say how much of it really has to do with balance and how much of it has to do with the fact that, uh, well, the game is really freaking hard and certain players are just better at it. Got ourselves a cheeky little proxy pile. This is not the norm. So I have criticized Max Specs in the past a little bit. It's kind of hard to find criticism. But he used to be a very cheesy man. And then he became a very defensive Protoss to the point where he became a bit too predictable. And he's starting to mix it in again, especially when he's leading a series. He is not afraid to bring a bit of aggression towards the opponent. So this is going to be a double barracks opener right here for Klim. That does mean that he's not going to have any Cyclones in the earlier stages of it. It's going to be a triple gate for the time being. And we'll have to see how all in Max Specs wants to go with this. Warp gates are done in 10 seconds. And obviously, Terran can't really move around the map all too much. The main downside here for Max Specs, of course, is that he does not have a Prism and he does not have Blink. So, we just have the units as they are. Downside here for Clem is that he doesn't have Stimpak or Combat Shields or anything like that, and he certainly will not have Medivex anytime soon. So, these are basically just uh, the most vanilla version of the, the units going up against the most vanilla version of the units right now. Now, this will be the moment where Clem realizes that something is a bit fishy. He decides to pull the boys, gets a snipe on one of the adepts, immediately fires up a bunker. Scary, though, to pull the SCVs, obviously, because you end up losing a lot of mining time. Maxpex is going to continuously warp in more units. He did make a Twilight Council on the back of this, too. Ooh, missed control right here. Nice snipe on that Stalker. Adept shade forward. A little too far forward. Yeah. Even though Clem is sort of stabilizing, the problem is that he is still losing a load of SCVs in the process, plus a ton of mining time, but he does finish the bunker here. And finishing that bunker is huge. On this map on Site Delta, it's one of the only maps, actually, it might be the only map, that currently has a ramp leading up from the natural, or I guess leading down from the natural. So this particular build on this map is a bit tricky. Because like I said, Maxpex does not have an easy way to get vision up on that high ground since he doesn't have higher tier units. He can technically use the shades, I guess, but it's not as reliable. Okay. Now, Stimpak is going to finish up. Combat shields on the back of it. We have Marauder Production 2. Blink has been fired up on the other side of the map, but it's a bit late. Third Nexus is about a quarter or so of the way done. I don't think Maxpex really wants to fight over here until Blink is finished, but... Clem doesn't know that. So he keeps on threatening. Okay. Yep. So here's Stimpak done. Look how proud these dudes suddenly are. They have their combat drugs ready to go. Suddenly they feel really ambitious. Their stimulation packs. Well, apparently Jimmy was a little eager there. Wanted to show it off immediately. You know what? Even though the gateway is gonna go down, the entire Terran army is being used for it. Okay, nah, this is gonna be fine. There were still a few reinforcing units inside of the main base. Alright.
Survival achieved. But what uh, at what cost, right? That's the main question here. And one thing that Clem did do really nicely, which I do like, is not go overboard on the defense. So you can hold on by just making a ton of units. But if Protoss just expands behind it and you don't have a third base coming yourself in a reasonable time, you will still fall very far behind S. Terran. So barracks coming up. Six additional gateways on the production tab too, though, for Protoss. <laughs> <laughs> Both players trying to pick off the weakened units here, primarily. Templar Archives, once again, from x -Pex. Yeah, I don't mind it. Seems to be his most successful style so far. The Disruptors are nice, but Clem is really good at microing against him. Where Storm is more or less instant. Just a difficult transition to achieve. But it might just be the better play overall. So one gas over in the natural. Double gas taken over at the third now. That's curious. In the meantime though, Clem is happily macroing up himself. Yeah, he doesn't have the infantry upgrade yet, but it's gonna be done within the next half minute. Ghost Academy comes up, okay. So he's ready to start up that ghost transition. What is the song again? Go ghost Division, that's what it is, by Sabaton. Ghost transition is something else entirely, but still important in this matchup. Especially when you're going up against somebody who will more than likely bring High Templar with Storm, or at the very least Archons, or at the very least a bunch of chart slots into the mix. And here we go again. They have a private plane. Only four seats. Isn't that insane? War prisms, I don't know what the lore of StarCraft 2 says, but I feel like they must be massive. And you can only have four seats in that thing? Seems ridiculous. The true VIPs of the Protoss army. Robo Bay on the back of this too, together with a fourth Nexus. So Clem would love to play that Turtley style once again. Yeah, Site Delta is big. Loads of different bases to uh, to take, so can't really blame him. Even though I personally don't love the turtle approach, there's no denying that it's very successful. Yeah, fight over here in the middle of the map, though. Storm. Yeah. No EMPs available yet. I think there may be a few co. Yeah, there's a few ghosts available right now. They just popped out of the the barracks. They're gonna be absolutely critical. Obviously, the Ghost EMP skill, it removes energy as well as shields from Protoss units. One of the most powerful abilities in the game. And yet one that nobody talks about very much. <laughs> I've always found that kind of interesting. Got another Nexus. Building all the way up north. Clem's army right now is looking humongous. Like, 176 army supply versus barely 140 is insane. Yes, ultimately, Max Specs will have a strong force too, but there's a lot of opportunities right now for Clem to go. I feel like Clem is sometimes maybe playing a bit too passive? Because there will be a lot of games where Max Specs is just playing uber greedy. Maybe not necessarily in this one, but... It is not uncommon for Protoss players at this level to fall behind slightly in the earlier stages of the game and then to just play incredibly greedy. Just build all the upgrades, get all the tech. A lot of the top tier Terrans do like to sit back against it, but... <laughs> like a roaring lion over here inside of that prism. The Terran army immediately retreated. If you have a lion standing in front of you and it roars in your face, you would back off as well. If you have a wizard summoning lightning right in front of your path, you would say Gandalf, chill. And then, you know, retreat. Important, though, to, you know, tell Gandalf to chill. Ooh. Okay. Colossi are coming up again. There's the fusion core. Plus two, plus two. A reasonable time. We've got ourselves additional command centers coming up. Clem is maxed out right now. So rather than playing super turtly, he's decided to make a bit of a move while transitioning towards what seems to be Ghost Liberator. 
Base at the 12 o'clock position is getting absolutely destroyed. But Colossi do have their range research right now. Okay, one of the ghosts gets EMP'd and then murdered. But already though, Clem did kill that expansion and that is obviously the main goal. Clem still with an insane amount of supply. Yeah, he's trying to bait the Protoss units out. So far though, not really hitting that super juicy EMP that usually gets hit. Lovely control here by Maxpex as far as positioning his army goes. 20 probes in the end though is nothing to scoff at. Plus of course a Nexus on the back of that too. I think Maxpex is gonna try and take that base over here on the left side of the map though. This is obviously quite predictable. Clem. Okay, thinking about making a dash for the main base with four Metavex. Couple of Widow Mines here, still busy being cleaned up. He actually just unloaded. I think he's anticipating that this base is gonna be remade, and you know what? He is exactly right. Look at Jimmy over here. Jimmy sees everything. Jimmy knows all. Great move. Lovely play. Clem shuts it down a second time around. Oh. <laughs> That moment when the train leaves before you manage to get on. In the meantime though, Terran has moved on over towards the left side of the map. There are Templar inside of that prism. Nice flank, although he did get, I think, the prism with two Templar inside of it. That is quite costly. Zealot in the meantime, okay, dealing quite a bit of damage over there, but the planetary got it killed. Clem still has that army over here. He's thinking about targeting the base, but the recoil is gonna prevent him from doing so. Aggressive move into the main base. Two Metavex get tapped out of the sky very quickly. Majority of the Protoss army though is still on the left side of the map. Okay. No Colossi have actually gone down. So it shows only one Templar going down here, but I don't really know exactly if it counted the ones as well inside of that prism. Clem, by the way, going into the quick research there for the Metavex. It's nice and all, but honestly, this Protoss army is looking absolutely huge. Wait, hold up right now. Is Maxpex just gonna A-move and win? After all this elegance, the Protoss army just comes marching in? Yeah. I think that's it. I think that's game. Maxpex just decided to uh, put all of his units in one big ball together. And there it is, despite being quite far behind in the earlier stages of this game, Maxpex, well, holds on to the aggression, stabilizes, and then ultimately wins the grand finals of the Weekly Cup, 3-1 over Klimt.